everyone, Randy with Extreme Sandbox here. Today, we're gonna to be doing our complete training overview of our mini excavator. Yes, this is gonna combine all the different elements we have done individually into one video, so check this out. Everyone will get a lot of requests for one complete training video for all of the different components for our mini excavator. So as you know on our YouTube channel, we have this broken down into individual sections, individual videos, but we thought it'd be helpful to put this all together in one longer format video uh, so you can see all the different parts. So in this training video, there's gonna be four segments here. The first one will be our pre-op inspection. The second will be our basic controls, our 101 training. Our third section will be the 201 or advanced skills training. And then our fourth and final is our shutdown procedures, the parking at the end of the day. So let's go through and we'll start with all four sections. Okay, for the beginning is our pre-op inspection. This is probably the most important part of operating any piece of equipment is doing a thorough pre-op inspection. So we're gonna go through and I'm gonna walk through how I do a pre-op inspection. The first thing I always tell people, I'm not an expert. These are things that I've learned and how I do it, but there are a lot of different ways to do it. I always recommend checking the manual uh, for the equipment. They're gonna give recommendations. We are running a Komatsu PC35 mini excavator today. Uh, now my pre-ops, if you've seen my training video, I really break it down into three different components. And this is just how I prefer to do it. That way I do it the same on each piece. The first is a general walk around. That's just gonna be a big picture, looking for anything obvious that sticks out. The second piece is the compartment check. That's where I'm actually opening doors, checking fluids, uh, anything inside the machine. And then my third is in the operator seat. This is when I actually get inside the cab. So those are, that's the way I do it. Uh, but again, there's, there's really no right or wrong here. It's just having a routine so you do it the same way. Now, I can't stress this enough. You do not need to be a diesel mechanic. I think a lot of people, new operators especially, are intimidated by the machine and they don't know what they're looking for. So I'm gonna show you, I'm not a diesel mechanic, uh, but you also don't need to be. Some of those things are just really obvious and it's not as much about knowing exactly what's wrong with the machine, it's just knowing that something doesn't look right and you may need to reach out to the dealer uh, to get that followed up on. That's when you have a diesel mechanic. So don't be intimidated, uh, but a pre-op is extremely important to check your machine before you get started. With that said, let's go ahead and start our pre-op. So I always start on the driver's or operator's side of the piece of equipment, and then it's, I usually do counterclockwise, uh, but it's really, uh, there's a lot of different preferences on that. Starting at the top, I always start at the top of the machine. We always get focused on the undercarriage, which probably is the most important part other than the engine, uh, but it is good because sometimes we miss things. So we're looking for any obvious sides of damage, anything like that. So I'm looking at the top, making sure all the glass, there's no damage, anything I'm noting there. If I've got lights on the machine, I'm making sure those aren't cracked. Coming down, uh, this is where I'm looking at the undercarriage then. So I'm looking uh, for an excavator. You know, first of all, I'm seeing if there's any obvious signs of damage, if there's any debris, large rocks or anything in the undercarriage system. Uh, and then looking at all of the, uh, basically the rollers that I have there all the way around. I've got my uh, idler in the front, making sure that's free, there's no damage, anything like that. And then my drive system is uh, in the back. That's where you're actually gonna see the sprocket and the teeth and everything like that. Now, when I look at this, I'm just looking to see if there's any damage to my track pads as I go around. Mini excavators is a rubber track machine, uh, but so they can have things actually get lodged in them. And just making sure that all the, uh, everything's connected correctly in there, that I don't see any pins or anything missing on there. The rollers look free. There's nothing in the rollers that would uh, keep them from moving. And then on that final drive in the back, you know, that's where you're looking for if there was any leaks, uh, any fluids or anything coming out. That would be important, making sure the teeth aren't too sharp on the sprocket, the ones I can see, and looking all around that. I'm also looking at track tension, just to make sure on these, you're gonna have a little bit of sag in your tracks, but you don't obviously want it too tight, you don't want it too loose. But everything looks good there. I'm gonna continue walking counterclockwise. Okay, counterclockwise now on the back of the machine. Again, I always start at the top, work my way down. You know, for this one's fairly simple. I do have a mirror in the back of the machine, uh, but the glass, everything, there's no damage, anything obvious noted on there coming down. This is where it's good to get down low uh, with any machine. This is where you can usually see all the way underneath it. So this is, you know, I tell people it's very similar to having your car parked in your garage. When you back out, if you see an oil stain on the ground, you know you might have an issue. 
This is where if the machine's been sitting, I'm looking all the way into the machine to see if anything looks like it's been uh, any fluids, oil, hydraulic fluid, uh, coolant, anything that might seem wet uh, or something I wanna look at further. So I'm also looking on the inside of the undercarriage. I can see the inside of the drive system on both sides as well I can see all the way through. This is also where I might be able to note any damage on the track system on both sides is what I'm looking at there. And then finally as well, the exhaust system, the mini excavators, the exhaust is down low. So I'm making sure there's no obvious damage or anything to the pipe, everything's intact there. And then on the other side, continuing counterclockwise, again, I'm just doing a visual inspection, starting at the top, seeing if I see any damage. The lights are intact up there, my mirror on the side coming down. And then again, the undercarriage system. Same thing I was looking at as on the other side, making sure all the track pads, I don't see any damage on any of the track pads. Uh, the rollers look free. The idler up front, I don't see any damage, uh, any rocks being lodged in there. And then my drive motors in the back, seeing if the sprocket, you know, the teeth aren't overly sharp, they're not missing any teeth. Also, if I see any leaks around the drive cylinder, the drive motors there, that would be something I'd want to look at. And then overall track tension. Is it too tight? Is it too loose? Anything I might observe there. And then on to the front of the machine. Now with our excavators, you got your main arm there. So I look at one side and I get the other. But looking at the front, again, I always start in the top of the cab itself, looking down, making sure the glass, there's no damage to the cab, the lights I see again and then basically looking at the arm. Now this is where you start seeing all those hydraulic lines on the machine that are on the arm. This is where you're looking at all the connections, seeing if I see anything that looks like it's leaking that's not connected, if there's a damaged hose anywhere. And then coming down the front there, my hydraulic cylinders. So this one for the backhoe arm here, I can see the cylinder on this side. Any hydraulic cylinder I'm looking at, I'm seeing right around the point of the cylinder where it goes in, that's where you're going to initially show any signs. If the seal's not good, I'm going to see some oil that potentially would be coming out and usually dirt or something might get, uh, you know, that'll stick to oil. So if I see anything that's obvious there, uh, and then all my connections, anytime there is a connection, uh, you know, I'm looking, you know, the pins and bushings, if there's any damage, anything obvious there. I um, can see all my grease joints at the same time. So that's also where I'm looking if it doesn't look like it's been greased. That might be something. And then coming all the way down the mini excavator, we have a blade system on the front here. Same thing, making sure these are connected to the machine, making sure connections are all tight there. The hydraulic lines that are underneath that run to that, don't see any obvious damage. The blade itself, don't see any damage. Anything loose looks something that I might need to dig deeper into. As I'm looking, then I'm going along the entire boom, stick, and bucket. I'm looking at all of the lines here and then my hydraulic cylinders that are up there. Looking to see if anything's obvious on any of the lines on here coming all the way down. If I see any connections, anything that might look loose on any of these things. And then coming all the way down, same thing on all the cylinders. Seeing if anything looks that might be damaged. If I see any cylinders, anything like that. My pins, my pins and bushings, everything is connecting. I'm making sure it looks like there's grease. And then my teeth on my hydraulic thumb, as well as my bucket, making sure the bucket doesn't look like it has wear on it that might need to be addressed before I start using the machine. After that, I'm gonna to come to the other side. Okay, and then completing the circle counterclockwise, this side of the arm. Same thing, I'm looking on this side of the arm, the hoses, the hydraulic cylinders. If I see anything that looks, again, leaks on the hydraulic cylinders at all, any of, if there's any connections, any of these bolts that might be missing or loose. Uh, again, anything, it doesn't, I don't need to be a mechanic to look at something just, it doesn't look right. Those are the things you need to look into further. All of my hydraulic lines, everything looks connected. There's no leaks, I don't see anything obvious. I've got a hydraulic cylinder up top there. Coming down, again, light up front, make sure it's not damaged. Looking at this side of the bucket, still just working my way down. Any obvious damage or anything I see here, and then all my lines, again, I'm looking, they come through the center there and snake up. This is where you can look at the top of the arm to see if I, any connections, anything's loose on any of those. Okay, so we completed the walk around. Again, that's big picture. That's just looking for anything obvious that might stick out. The second piece I do is compartments. On any piece of equipment, I tell Bill, you should be opening every single compartment that's easily accessible. You know, anything that you don't have to use a screwdriver or anything to open. So this is just look for any damage or anything obvious. So on my mini excavator, on this one, I'm gonna pop open the side compartment. This is where all my hydraulic controls are. Uh, this also is where you can switch it from ISO to SAE. 
But also I can look in here and if there's any damage on the hydraulic system, I'm gonna see any leaks or potentially something might be visible in there. Don't see anything there, that looks good. Close that. Then I'm gonna access the engine compartment around the back. So on this machine, I've got my engine oil to check in here. I've also got my fuel filter. Uh, and this is where I'm looking in the fuel itself to seeing if there's any debris, any water, anything I'd see in that separator there that might need to be addressed. And then my oil. Checking that to make sure it's at the appropriate level. And then other than that, I always, anytime I open a compartment, I'm just looking to see if anything hose, anything looks obviously damaged. Everything looks good there. On this Komatsu, I have to leave that compartment open to access the other. So I'll open this side compartment. So on this side, I'm looking, again, top to bottom, my air filters right here. This is the little discharge. If I were to open this, a lot of debris came out. I most likely would pull this. We generally don't clean our air filters. You know, about once a week, we would pull that out. This thing just unclips, but on a daily, I just open the compartment, make sure there's nothing uh, clogged in there. As I'm coming down here, I can see my coolant level is right there. Hydraulic fluid level is right over here. A lot of that hydraulic fluid level is gonna be based on how you park the machine. The way we park them, typically they're gonna be in the low uh, positioning. So I'm at the low level there. Uh, if I wouldn't be able to see it, or depending on how it's positioned, I'd wanna note where that, how the hydraulic cylinders are placed. Obviously, if I had them fully extended, this should be up near the high mark. And then I'm looking at my battery connections down there. Make sure there's no damage, anything obvious there. And then finally, the radiator. You know, I'm looking at that, the grid there, if anything looks damaged, anything obvious there. And that completes that compartment. Final compartment, this one right here flips up. This is where the fuel is. So obviously make sure I got the cap on here. Uh, and then my windshield washer fluid, radiator fluid cap, or my coolant, sorry, my coolant cap is right there. And then again, anytime I'm opening a compartment, just making sure there's no obvious damage, anything like that. Everything looks clear there. After that, now we're gonna get into the operator seat to check the final components. Final, my pre-op inspection is the operator seat. So first thing I always make sure when I open the door, it locks. It's important to make sure those lock open, otherwise they're gonna flip you in the back of the head. Uh, and then make sure all my handles, all everything to get a three points contact to get in the machine. Everything looks intact there. Once I'm in the machine, before I actually turn it on, you know, I just want to make sure all the levers, you know, joysticks, everything's working. So I'm going to put that, my, that's my safety lock lever, make sure that's operable, locks down. Make sure my joysticks, you know, look free, they're moving freely, the boots and everything are fine there. I'm checking my seat belt, make sure there's no damage on that. And that, that works. Again, anything, I'm looking for any damage, anything obvious that sticks out to me on the inside here. Everything looks good there. I'll pull that back up. Uh, finally, I'll key it up and I'll just turn it one click over. This is where I'm gonna look at my display and see if there's any warning signs, any indicator I shouldn't start. Checking my fuel level, all the fluids that I, uh, I wanna see. You know, if there was, this one does not run on diesel exhaust fluid, but there would be a gauge on another machine. Uh, right now, my fuel looks good on there. And then I usually will just crank it up. Just making sure everything started, nothing sounds abnormal in there. Again, making sure I have no indicators on the display at all, and everything looks good to go. That's the completion of my pre-op inspection. Okay, now that we completed our pre-op inspection, now we're going into our basic operations. I call it our 101. Again, this is gonna be very entry level. If you're an operator already, uh, you know, I'm gonna tell you that some of this is bear with me because I wanna go over basic controls first and then we'll get into more advanced on the next section. So once I'm in the machine, again, seatbelt on. I've already started this. We're already running right there. Again, looking at my, see if there's any indicators, anything on the display that would keep me from wanting to basically run the machine or I need to check it out further. Um, after that, throttle. 
Some of these machines will have an auto idle. Uh, that'll basically take it down when we're not running the machine. Uh, but right now I have it off so that I'm at high idle right there, high throttle, sorry. Now my safety lock lever on this, it's your left, um, there's a big red safety lock lever here. The, basically all machines are gonna have some form of shutoffs there. So depends on what you're using, but the machine, the controls won't work at all if that is up. Now for this Komatsu machine, they're usually raised the armrest too on a mini excavator just because they're very tight compartments. So I'm gonna lower that down. Now that that's down, everything's live on the equipment. Now, I'm gonna go over basic controls here. Okay, so we're running standard ISO controls. Some people call them CAT controls, where it's your right is your boom and bucket, your left is your stick and swing. Again, now every machine, especially new machines, are gonna have options. If you saw when I did the pre-op, there's always an area, a valve, that basically can change it between ISO and SAE. Uh, some people call them CAT versus John Deere controls. There really is no right or wrong on that. There is some confusion about what the control is what, but ISO is cat controls, meaning right is boom bucket, left is stick swing. I would say it's the most common, and if I was a brand new operator, that's what I would teach myself, basically. Uh, but again, there's no right and wrong there. So with that said, uh, right hand, if I pull back in this right right now, it raises my boom arm up. If I push right hand forward, it'll bring that boom back down. If I go right hand to the right, it opens the bucket. And if I go right hand to the left, we'll close the bucket. Right there, that's all of my right hand. Now, on the left hand is my stick and swing, my S's. If I go left hand forward, it'll push the stick out. If I pull back, it's gonna bring the stick back towards me. And then my swing, if I go left hand to left, it'll swing left. If I go left hand right, it will swing right. And there is no hard stop on the swing. This thing will just keep, it's on a turntable there. It'll keep spinning around. Bring it back around to straight. Those are my two joysticks. Now you've, with the mini excavator, you have some added components on this. Uh, we've got both a hydraulic thumb and a backhoe adjustment, as well as the blade itself. So I'm gonna go over, there's some foot controls here. So for Komatsu, and the thumbs can be different based on the manufacturer. Again, I'm going over Komatsu right now. Most of them are fairly similar. Some will have a trigger instead on the joystick, but for these on the floor, there's actually little lockout levers, or little covers to the plates if you're not using them. But on this Komatsu one, it's controlled with your left foot for the hydraulic thumb. So if I push forward on that, it brings my hydraulic thumb closed. And if I push on the back of this, it will open that. Generally, you wanna store it all the way up, uh, retract it all the way so it's out of the way there. That's my left foot pedal. For my right foot pedal, that's my back hoe adjustment. That's where my arm itself will turn. So if I go to the right with that, it will actually spin my arm to the right. If I go on the left side of this, it will spin the arm to the left. And then I'll bring it back to straight. Now, generally I don't, the backhoe arm, it's useful if you're in a really tight area, you know, where you need to drive your machine right up, maybe next to a house foundation or something. But generally, I use the, the swing uh, to actually move the tool to where I need it. I don't use the backhoe adjustment, the arm itself as much. And that's that one. And then to the right of my joystick, there is my blade control. It's either a, a blade, a stabilizer, there's a lot of different names for it and how you use it. Um, but that is right in front here. If I pull back, it raises it up. If I push forward, it goes down. I have a fixed blade on this Komatsu machine. Some will actually swing. Some of you might have some adjustments on them, which they would have extra controls on that. This one's fixed just up and down. I'll show you how you use that shortly. You know, it can be used for backfilling. Uh, it's not the most efficient, but it does. It's better than sometimes using the bucket. Uh, but it's also probably more important as a stabilizer bar. Uh, with this smaller machine, it actually makes your footprint, it extends you a little bit. So you're gonna be a little bit more stable in that machine. Obviously you wanna have that up before you start driving it all. Finally is our tracks. In front, and this is the same with pretty much any excavator, you're gonna have two track paddles, which have foot controls. Again, with Komatsu, 
they kind of store these little flip down. I can either use my feet or my hands. Would not use both. Typically for a brand new operator, what I generally recommend is just using your hands initially. So, because that way I'm either driving or I'm using the joysticks, I'm not doing both. Now keep in mind though, as you get more proficient, an expert to be more efficient is going to, you're gonna have your feet on there when you're driving, you'll have your hands on the joystick so you can do multiple. Um, so with that said, driving position. Now there's a lot of different uh, philosophies on how you drive. Typically I have the boom up, you want the bucket, I don't know, a foot or so off the ground. Um, and then I like, you wanna be squared to your tracks. Now this machine will drive any configuration, but generally it's the least confusing is when you're sitting right down this, and the mini ice cream, you're kind of sitting in the center a little bit, a little bit offset to the left, but you're kind of square. I can look out my window and see I'm square. And then all I'm doing is pushing these. Now these track paddles are independent of each other. And what that means, the right one controls the right. If I push forward, pull back like that. Left one, same thing, push forward on one, pull back. And then it will actually go opposite. So if I was trying to do a hard turn, I can push one, pull back on the other, either way. Now with that said, you wanna try and avoid that because as you do that hard turn, you are digging up all of that ground underneath you. So generally you wanna try and maintain some motion. If you wanna steer, you're just letting off on one of them just to slowly start steering that direction. Once you're in that position to wherever you're gonna be and dig, that's where we're gonna move into the next component. Now. Talked about the stabilizer bar. Generally, you're gonna to wanna to lower that before you start digging. So, I'm gonna push this down. And usually a little bit of downward pressure, I might actually feel it pick up my machine a little bit. Uh, in the next, the advanced portion, I'll talk a little bit about blade positioning. Uh, for simplicity here, for the basic operations, just put it in front. It's the, you know, kind of protects your tracks too. You'll see that in a second here. Uh, but there are a couple different schools of thought on that. So, now that I'm lined up here, I'm gonna make sure my throttle's all the way up. I kinda had it down a little bit. First thing I'm gonna do, we're gonna extend our stick all the way out. Now again, this is for a new operator. Uh, I like distance is kinda your friend. So the further away you are from the machine, again, I think it's safer. As an operator though, you're generally not gonna be fully extended. I'll show that a little bit more in the advance, but for simplicity, I really like to just have it extended out. Then right hand forward, I bring that boom down. You stop about uh, six inches off the ground. This is where you're gonna adjust the blade angle. We always start with those teeth, kind of straight down, even out. Again, this is not, there's some changes once you get, once you have more stick time. This is probably not the preferred way as an operator to dig, but again, I like to just start for a new operator um, to show the basics. After that, I stick the teeth in. Once they're in, I'm just showing you one at a time, very simple motions, boom down, then I'm just gonna curl that bucket right hand left. I'm gonna curl this bucket all the way up till it stops on its own right hand back and then I'm just going to get it a few feet off and then I'm going to swing left or right with it. A few feet away you don't ever want to go too far from that uh, wherever your hole is because you're going to have to backfill it later and then you're going to dump. Now that was with my boom extended there. The other one you'll do is once you line back up here go right hand back and pull that stick straight down. And then this is where you need to make some adjustments to those teeth. Straight up and down there. And go forward, curl that up. Raise it up. You'll notice that bucket gets closer to you. Again, this is where that stick can come all the way in. Typically, assuming you don't have any, a special, a quick coupler and attachment, the machine's designed not to hit itself meaning if I pull this in, it won't hit that arm. However, if you have a quick coupler or some extra attachment on there, that may not be true. So understand what your machine, what you have on there. Um, but this pushes your distance, that'll push it back out. And then I extend out. And then I'll dump right there. So again, those are my basic controls, kind of went over those different pieces. So I'm just gonna dig a little bit more here to show you some extra components.
Now that I've done a couple of scoops, again, I like to start new operators very simple, one motion at a time. Now, as you get a little bit more proficient there, that's where you're gonna start doing multiple things. Now, to really do an effective trench, first of all, you'll, you know, I may be all the way out there, but usually I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do it in layers. You don't necessarily wanna go all the way down and just curl that bucket in. If there were something underground there, you don't wanna to get too aggressive on those where you're just going all the way down, curling that bucket in. So with that said, you're gonna kind of have, this is where you start getting better at pulling the stick in at the same time, you're almost scraping the bottom of that trench. And this is something that you just have to get stick time at. The only way you'll get better is by just doing multiple motions at the same time. And this, I'm gonna show you in the next piece, a little bit more a raking skill that kind of, it's an exercise to practice this. But generally this is your teeth will be in about 45 degrees and you're just taking off in layers. Instead of going one full bucket width down, you're basically doing one layer at a time where you're just scraping up some. Now this also is why, if you can see, why I also had the blade in front of me. Now this machine absolutely can hit my tracks. Now, the reason I like new operators to start with that blade up front is now I'm only gonna dam I'm just gonna hit the blade. So it's not gonna do any damage there. So this is why I generally for new operators, I recommend having that blade in front. I'm gonna show you in the next video, next segment here, why it might not, why having it the other position might be better. Now that I've dug a trench, now let's just talk about backfilling. Two different ways, you know, the great thing about mini excavators, uh, they're a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. They're not great at any one thing, but they do multiple. With backfilling in any excavator, first of all, I always recommend using your bucket uh, to move a material. So with this amount of material I have up there, generally you're gonna be scooping through it. Now I'm just trying not to break the surface level though, because I don't wanna grab any new material. Now a lot of operators, some people are like, well, can I use the side of the bucket? You can, it's not, First of all, these machines, the, the lateral, the turntable on this is really just designed to move the tool where I need it to go. It's not great on the machine. You also got all those, uh, all your pins and bushings in there that if you do a side load, it's not great on the machine. So generally you're just using that for a finish grade at the end. So right now I'm just taking scoops. Now as I raise it, I can try and swing over a little bit there and I'll be able to use some of that, but again, I'm not just gonna be using the side. This is where I'm also kind of scraping it in a little bit and doing those multiple motions to pull it in and then just swinging over. This is where getting better at using multiple motions is really good. Now, there is a way, you know, with an excavator, I can use just the side of the bucket. Once I get closer to the ground here, this is where I can kind of get the blade you kind of want to have it level to the ground. If I use on this side, the key here is you don't just want to have, if I have that bucket like this, you're going to kind of create a little, uh, little valley there. So generally you want your teeth flat to the ground. And I try and use those teeth to match the surface level there. If I know that's kind of my version of level, and then I'm able to just swing through and take layers off. So if I were doing the other side, this is what I'm doing to backfill right there. I can get this little edge here and adjusting my teeth and this will kind of get it you know, somewhat level there. But the other avenue I'm gonna show is how to use the blade on this. So, now if I were to use the blade, again, taking my hands off the joysticks there. Now I've got a load of dirt right in front of me here, so if I just pull back just to get downward pressure off, now I'm gonna use my feet. I can actually just push that in right there, and then I'm just gonna back up. Raising that up. And then I'm just gonna bring this around over to the side. Now, because I just kind of rutted up the ground there a little bit, wherever I'm turning, I like to do, again, this, I have a fixed blade on this machine, so it's a little bit tougher. But again, now I'm just using my right hand over here on the side 
and I'm just going. I'm watching both sides, but you'll see I'm kind of pushing through my ruts, but I know I'm aiming towards my trench. So eventually here I know I'm going to pick up this material that was left. And this is, you know, it's kind of like using a bulldozer. I've, we've done a training video on that. Is that seat of the pants feel what my machine's doing? If I feel it tilting one way or the, uh, the other, I'm making some subtle adjustments here. Now again, as I back up again, I'm trying to line up to get that other pass over there. So again, dropping that blade, using just my right hand, I'm doing all my driving with my feet. And then just making sure I'm pushing this material into the trench. It's tougher with a fixed blade because you don't have that way to angle that blade. But you'll see that, and I'm just gonna drive, pull that back. So you see that was, again, they're not great at backfilling. The rest of this way, if you really wanted to finish it where I would use the side of the bucket. Now, final piece I wanna go over is a hydraulic thumb. So again, I had it retracted to dig. Now if I spin over here. So a couple of things with the hydraulic thumb, you know, first of all, I like to show people it will not, so I'm gonna to go to the max limit right here. That's as far as it'll go. So it's never gonna go all the way out. This is where using your bucket control, I can kind of pinch into it and you'll see how that forces it. It's kind of pushing the two together. Um, so understanding that when you're picking items up. So have it retracted. For this, I'm just putting, yeah, we use uh, whatever you can find to practice on. You know, these are, can be pretty useful to pick up a lot of different things, but understanding what you're picking up. Once I have it pinched in there, so now I'm holding pressure on this tire. Uh, I can go left, right, I can extend, stick out, stick in. Uh, the only thing is if I open that bucket, if I go right or left of that right joystick, that's what's gonna lose it. So now anytime you're picking up items, understand weights, you know, understand your center of gravity on the machine. If there's, there's a limit to how much you can pick up on these machines. So if I bring that over here, set it wherever I'm gonna have it. And then right there, slowly opening. Again, the key is slow and steady on any of these hydraulic controls. Retracted there. And that's the hydraulic thumb there. So that's it for the basic controls. Now let's move into the next segment. Okay, so you saw our basic operations. You know, the first thing I'll tell you, and I think I said it earlier, no video you're gonna watch, no classroom training you're gonna take is gonna make you a good excavator operator. It's all about seat time. So the more you get in there and practice, the better you'll be. So now in this advanced portion, I just wanna throw a few extra pieces out there uh, that may help some others, you know, and, and some more advanced skills. So on this, I wanna show a, a raking exercise to kinda how you would uh, excavate on a trench, those skills you'll need. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about blade positioning and then we'll talk about crossing a trench. Uh, those are the things we'll cover here in the advanced portion. So uh, with the raking exercise, I really like this. Someone showed this to me before and I thought as a new operator it was really good. But I also think for an advanced person, this is something that is really easy to practice in any excavator. What it is is basically taking your teeth, extending out, putting just the tooth in the ground, uh, maybe an inch or two, and then seeing if you can keep those, you basically want to rake it in towards you. So you're keeping the teeth without, you want to keep seeing daylight between the teeth and the bucket. So uh, that little gap, I don't want to be sunk all the way in the ground, but I also don't want any of those teeth to raise up above the ground. So you'll see I'm actually doing multiple motions. I'm pulling the stick in. Once my stick gets to that pivot point on the boom arm, this is where it takes a lot of challenge because you actually have to start pushing forward a little bit too early there. I'll have to start pushing forward on my boom to bring it down. So the ideal there is, again, this is a great way to practice that managing the end of the bucket. So where your teeth are, whether it's teeth, a flat bucket, but can you rake that material 
and you can go over just a hair and keep trying this. And the goal is to not let that sink too deep. This is, I think, a great advanced skill for someone that takes a lot of finesse. Sometimes if you're having trouble, I tell people, throw it down to idle, where it's a lower and your hydraulics won't be quite as jumpy there. And it gives you just a little bit more finesse. But it's I'm opening the bucket, pulling the stick in. I'm doing all of those motions at the same time. This is extremely helpful when you start trying to dig a trench out because you need to manage those now at the bottom of a trench. So you're coming in at an angle. The other piece there along with raking is pushing material out. So we didn't cover this a lot in digging, but you know, often you'll use the back of the bucket to push material out. That's where you're just having that open. You usually wanna have the bottom of the bucket is what you're using. What you don't wanna do is have that bucket curled in. If I, you'll see some new operators trying something like this, this is bad. This is where all those connections, your uh, pins and bushings and everything, the connection for the bucket is right there. You don't want to necessarily push a bunch of dirt into there. So that's why in general, you want to have the bucket open anytime you're using the back of that to push them out. The other piece I kind of wanted to show here was that backhoe. We didn't talk about that in the entry uh, instruction. Now generally I recommend swinging. You're swinging at the center of the cab of the machine, the center pivot point of the machine. Now, if you get in those tighter configurations though, you may have to use that backhoe arm. And that's where you're just going left or right with that. But you'll see if I position this over, I can come over. All the controls are the same there. It's just you're digging at an angle there. Now again, for when you start talking advanced operation, this is where you gotta know you're not going, you don't wanna have those teeth straight down. You know, we teach that in the beginning just to get people used to the controls. But in general, when you're trenching, you're gonna to wanna to have a 45 degree angle and you're gonna come in, you're gonna scrape that in in layers. So typically for trenching, you wanna take off maybe six inches to a foot at a time, fill your bucket up. This is why, I'm sorry, you do this so you don't, in case there was something underground, even if you get a utility, you get everything marked, you're gonna run into different things on different sites. So that's why taking it off in layers is important. But once I have that in, now, if I were in a tight configuration where I couldn't spin my cab, I can do the same thing with just that arm. It's not quite as fast, uh, and it's not, again, it's a little bit tougher, at least I think, with your feet to run that. But that's how you run that backhoe arm there. Now, the other piece I want to talk about is blade positioning. Now, again, I showed you initially how uh, pushing this in the front is how I put a new operator. I like it because it can it, it really protects your tracks for a new operator. Uh, now with that said, you'll see I can lift that machine up there. If I try and take a big old scoop here, you will notice if I, first of all, if I push this thing down, uh, let me go flat here, I can actually pick up the entire machine. So when I have that in front of me, I'm not getting the benefit of that when I'm trying to push forward to get a full load. So you, it's a lot easier to do that. This is where a lot of people will put that blade behind them. So you'll see if I try that exact same thing now with that blade behind me, I can't do it. The machine will not pick up. So that's why sometimes people will put that blade behind them because you're gonna get a little bit more stability there when I'm digging off behind me versus in front. So that's why you might want to consider having that in the back of your machine. Again, I don't think there's a right and wrong on that. I think it's a little bit personal preference, uh, but that's kind of the reasoning. Obviously, digging no matter what, I usually recommend being in line with your tracks, either front or back. If you start digging off the side of your tracks, your machine, this is the same with any excavator, is not as stable at all. Um, you're digging off the side here. It's a lot easier to pick your machine up. Now, Couple things, we're gonna talk about crossing a trench here, but now while I have that machine up like that, it's about clearing your tracks too. You now this machine, always important to clear your tracks at the end of the day. This boom arm will pick up any side. So if I pick up one side, I can move my track system. This is helpful if you've got a lot of debris in that track system at the end of the day to raise it up just a little bit off the ground. You can pick up one side and you can pick up the other. This is helpful again to clear out your track systems. Same thing, you can actually, a uh, great thing about having a blade system like this, 
is I can put that boom back behind me. Now I can raise that up a little bit and then I can actually push my blade down. See the cool thing about these, and it actually makes it really easy if you were to throw a track at all on a mini excavator, you'll see I can raise the entire undercarriage system off the ground, which is pretty unusual. If you don't have that blade up there, you won't be able to do that. So I'll bring that back down. Now, final piece. Okay, finally gonna talk about crossing a trench. So, uh, typically, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, I generally recommend, we, I like to have my blade behind me. So I'm lining up my trenches over here. Our ground's really soft here. but I'm gonna get lined up. I have just a short trench there. Line up my machine and then I'm gonna come around. So typically you're gonna get right to the edge of whatever you're crossing. Now, first thing I can't stress enough, understand the width of your machine. And I know that sounds really obvious, but I've seen enough new operators and I can speak from experience. If you don't know the width of your tracks and you're trying to cross something larger, obviously it's gonna sink down. So first thing you wanna do is get to the edge there and then blade for a mini should be behind you and just a few inches off the ground. Uh, I like it behind me because it can kind of catch me if worst case scenario, things starts to slide. After that, at the point that you're crossing, you wanna extend all the way as far as you can reach out with that stick and then depending on the material, you know, bucket flat is going to probably do the least amount of damage, but if you were needing to bite in, this is probably if you're going up an incline as well, have the teeth out where you can actually grab in and pull some traction. But right now, I'm just going to keep it right above the ground. Now, at that point, I'm going to keep driving just a little bit until I can feel like I'm right at the edge of this. So I have my tracks hanging off just a little bit. At that point, I'm setting this down and just... You don't really, we're not trying to pop a wheelie here at all. I'm just trying to maintain it as I go over. So you do have to use, this is a combination of bring your boom up and stick in. And then I'm pushing back on these and I'm trying to pull myself across. So as I'm crossing, I can look out and see how far I am. And you're trying to get right to that center point. Yeah, it looks pretty close. So now you see if I bring my arm up, I'm actually straddling this. And again, my material is really soft here. So you have to be careful not to, if you go too fast, you'll actually pull some of that in. Which again, my material is so soft here. But I am, if I see right now, I'm completely supportive. My tracks are spanning that trench. Now I know my machine is, or my tracks are on the other side, so then I'm, now I'm getting in close though, because now I'm gonna actually have to pick up my front end to pull it over. So I'm trying to pick that up just a little bit, and I'm watching over my edge to start pushing it over. And again, trying to avoid popping too much of a wheelie. And once I know I'm past it, I see my tracks over it, and then I'm clear. Raising the blade back up, and then continuing. Spin that back around. So there you have it. Again, the same concept. It doesn't matter how long the trench is. Again, understanding the width of it, uh, but also using that same concept going up an incline. Uh, having your weight low, but also being able to grab in. Okay, so that completes the advanced portion. Now let's go over the shutdown parking procedures. 
So obviously it's always good to park square up with your tracks uh, kind of in the center of them. If you're off the side when you're trying to get out, you're losing your step. After that, blade should always be on the ground, flat. And then for us, we park it with the bucket flat to the ground like that. So everything's resting there. Turning my throttle down. Idling these machines, generally you want to let them 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, the newer equipment they actually recommend, you don't want to do excessive idling on these. So usually I just let it idle for 30 seconds to a minute. And then make, getting it ready for the next day. So this would be filling it up. So whether or not you're filling it up yourself, as someone on some job sites, they'll come in and fill them out overnight. But understanding uh, what the fuel level is so you're ready to go. At that point, I'm pulling the safety lock lever up, making sure everything's shut down there. And then I will turn the machine off. seat belt off and then we're going to get out to complete the final pieces the other thing i i tell new operators or actually any operator uh cleanliness making sure your machine is clean too it's if you had anything water or whatever you had in the machine with you during the day make sure you clean that out especially if it's a company-owned machine uh, they're going to be they're going to look at you a lot differently if you're taking care of the machine so making sure you don't have any trash we actually have brooms in ours that we sweep them out at the end of the day so i'm going to open the door and sweep all that out So our machine, we have a broom right behind. I always sweep the machine out. Final piece. You always want to clean your tracks at the end of the day. So, you know, there is material in these, so it's always important. I would do the same on the other side. And then I'm also just looking to make sure there's no damage. You know, during my shift, did anything else happen to it so I can report it ahead of time? Other than that, machine's all ready for the next day. Okay, everyone, that was our complete training overview for our Komatsu Mini Excavator. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want to see any of our training videos, just check out our YouTube channel. Thanks a lot for watching.